Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Megantri Pele. I'm very excited to moderate the session um, today, which is a partnership between SWIFT and the Encounters South African International Film Festival. SWIFT is the nonprofit organization, uh, Sisters Working in Film and Television, that advocates for women in film um, and television. So we're really excited to be hosting, I think maybe a, a very unique panel. It's a panel really looking at women in wildlife and nat natural history filmmaking. I'm gonna say that again, women in wildlife and natural history filmmaking. Um, this is an area that is uh, very sought after content, but also very difficult content to procure and, and actually make. Um, and I hopefully with our very exciting um, guests today and panelists, we can actually interrogate some of the issues around it. Um, the presence of women in wildlife is not common and not in South Africa and not globally either. And there are many reasons for it. It's, it's a very capital intensive process. It often takes very long periods of time um, to get the content that's required. And our big issue that we're wanting to engage is the lack of women in general, but also we're wanting to look at inclusivity. We wanted to, to look at diversity and we're wanting to reposition the whole conversation against the climate crisis um, that is currently at play. So multiple strands that we're hoping to tie together. Today, we're so excited to have um, Tembisa Jordan, who's a marine scientist, and she also is with Ezemvelu KZN Wildlife, um, and a new entrant into filmmaking. We're so excited to hear about her journey. We have Tessa Balin, who is also a graduate uh, from UCT and has made uh, lovely programming around um, ecology and has, whose form has, has seen many festivals and she'll ho hopefully tell us a little bit more about that and her journey. Um, we have Yolanda Mohatusi. Yolanda, um, is working on what I think is one of the most exciting uh, projects um, in terms of identity and uh, the climate crisis. I, I can't wait for you all to hear about it. Uh, Tembi, I'm sorry, Yolanda also has actually been a filmmaker for more than 12 years and she's made content across different genres. Um, so she brings a wealth of experience as well. Joining us uh, from SABC3, the head of SABC3 is Pat van Heerden. Uh, Pat is, um, has, has had an extensive career as a filmmaker and also as a commissioner. She was head of uh, Factual, so she can tell us a little bit about that many years ago. Um, and now as head of Channel, her position obviously uh, has expanded significantly in terms of the kind of programming. And I was saying, I'm actually watching a lot of SABC3 because of the new direction uh, of the programming, because of the diversity that I'm experiencing as a woman of color, as a black woman, I'm really excited about the direction it's taking. Welcome everyone. It's so exciting to have you all. Uh, I know I didn't fully do justice to your uh, amazing CVs and bios, so please do, um, you know, you can do a, a brief summary if you feel you need to, you know, in terms of where we're going with the conversation. Um, let's just start with um, a general understanding of where things historically have been in terms of uh, wildlife and natural history filmmaking. Um, what, what, are, what is your sense of, of historically what the framework has been. I know if I, whenever I watch, it's usually at the end of the credits, it's National Geographic and BBC who are the um, content owners, let's say, or commissioners of the majority of content, certainly that I've watched. What is, what is 
what 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 is your impression in terms of where we've come from historically in this field? Uh, who'd like to start? Yolanda? <laughs> Yeah, I can start. I can start also because I think it's a good question, McAndrew, because I, I, I was just thinking about it now. And um, for me, it just entering indeed the world of conservation and um, seeing that, never mind, uh, you know, historically, never mind there aren't enough women in there. I think there just aren't enough people of color. Um, so it was just very, it, it, that's why it was not anything that was at the back of my mind or anything that I saw um as a kind of a viable career option or this is a kind of work i'll be doing because I, I i don't know what kind of stories i'll be telling you know I, you know what i mean i don't know if i'll be you know I, I i would go in the bush and kind of film lions for a good six months you know what i mean i wasn't too sure what the scope of it was so mm -hmm. i may, imagine if i had those questions and if i had those reservations um many other filmmakers uh, also do and definitely filmmakers of color. So my big question was just in general, never mind where are the women in the space, but where are the mm -hmm. filmmakers of color? That was yeah, just a question that was in my head. Um, um should, Pat? should I yeah, I mean it just feels like such a huge um field that we're speaking of. I mean, if we look at South Africa and we look at um the consumption of natural history content that um, most of the programs that were natural history on SABC skewed 50 plus white male, um, which begins to tell you about how the framing was done um, and who was, you know, who was in natural history, who was featured in it, how um, the narrative was treated in more of a masculine way, I guess, more of a sort of aggressive, aggressive predator versus prey kind of. Um, and then if you think of, of the issues of land and the rarification of the natural history experience in terms of, of whiteness, um, I think that is also uh, the result of that is that women have not been in the production side of it. I mean, there are you know, obviously very, a lot more reasons than that, but essentially I think what we're speaking about is, is, really, is really trying to reframe that and to make sure that um, women are seen on screen, in science, um, behind the camera, um, and that the reframing of the narrative begins to be more accessible to female audiences, to, to, to women in particular. And you, you're beginning to see that the more natural history isn't rarefied and that the narrative isn't as uh, masculine as in the past. So, I mean, there's so much to speak about it. Also, the fact that women are more in sort of behavioral sciences, you know, rather than, you know, uh, you find, you know, people like, I guess, Diane Fossey and Jane Goodall, sort of observational primatologists, rather than, you know, in the sciences or carrying, or carrying the camera or, so, and then there's this sort of slow evolution of that. Um, but also you were saying that it was, a, that women are mostly in, you were saying BBC, but I think ABC and Australia has um, probably some of the highest uh, numbers of women in natural in natural history film and as uh, sort of hosts. So they're a pretty pretty good um, country to model on. Excellent. Um, let's jump into you know obviously historically. What would you think, before we jump into people's personal journeys and where they're at, let's just talk about what do you think some of the barriers and challenges have been for women in particular? Can anyone speak to that? Uh, I think that's a really, because we, we need to understand what are we dealing with in order to almost formulate a way through it or past it or around it. Um, well, I mean, if you, can I just kick off on something i mean if you think of of um you know that talk personally coming into an environment in which you're trying to do some deterrent activity around uh poaching of endangered species there's one woman in 14 men um if you look at the spaces of of rangers say in kenya uh women are women are, are told not to apply for rangers because 
um, men don't um, have a lot of control um, over themselves, so women can't go out in the field with them. I mean, this is literally from uh, Paula, um, what's her surname, Kahumbu, who said that, you know, she, she wanted to be a ranger in the beginning, but she was literally told, you know, this is really masculine field, and you have to carry a gun, and women don't carry guns. Um, so, you know, it's, it's uh, in that universe, the practical universe of it is so populated um, by men in the natural history field, obviously not in the environment. Women are at the forefront of much of um, the environment. So it's very, it's natural history I'm talking about in particular. Mm -hmm. Just add to what um, Pat's just said, and also just to add on to something that you had said previously, Pat, um, uh, mm -hmm. when you were describing uh, the sciences that women would then be found in. Okay, so if a woman is not a game racer or in the middle of, you know, uh, a, a forest or a nature what? reserve, or, you know, then they're doing other sciences. But um, if, if, even if we are in those spaces, it almost feels like uh, the women in those spaces or we don't feel like those stories are valid. Like it's not important enough or it's not strong enough or it's not big enough. It's not worthy of, you know, 20 minutes of, of, of screen time. You know, I, I feel like there, then there is that in the back of your mind. Like what, why is this a story? Like why is what I'm doing important? Um, well, what, whereas... you're, what you're saying, I mean, in part, I think you're talking about underselling. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, it's like, why? And I, I must be honest, I mean, it's, it's a journey that I went through with my story because I was like, this is so silly. It's about such a stupid thing. Who's going to watch this? I feel like I'm making a film for myself and maybe my sister who I'm forced to watch it with me. But you know what I mean? And I'm like, why? What am I doing? Like, why? Um, but it is important. And even what, what uh, Timbisa does, like, it, it's so valid. I remember seeing her uh, for the first time um, at uh, a, a film festival at Newth. And she was speaking, and first of all, I was like, oh, wow, black female scientist. And then she went on with what she was talking about. And I was like, what? That is so specific. I don't know what I was imagining in my mind or what I was expecting, but it's so like, whoa, this. And then still she went and she still made a film about that. And it's such a, a beautiful and just like, wow, it's such a riveting story and such a beautiful film. So I think it's just mm -hmm. validating that, no, you do have a story to tell. And what mm -hmm. you are doing, you're busy with whatever space you're occupying is important, you know, and it is valid. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's just made, what, what you said before just made me think of that. Yeah, yeah I think I, it's classic with women underselling themselves, underselling their abilities, underselling their stories. And, you know, even in the pitching room, when people are pitching stories, it's usually men that would say, I can do this. Um, you're absolutely going to get the best film ever. And women would say something, well, you know, I have some challenges. <laughs> Or, you know, be more... <laughs> um, yeah, I can definitely weigh in on that. Um, I was actually speaking to a friend of mine yesterday, um, Gunjan from India. Her and I both, um, when we got grants from National Geographic, and we were both we were both dealing with this imposter syndrome, because we tell ourselves that we we don't know why we here we don't deserve this but i think it, that is a big thing is this confidence right and i keep saying we need to channel our inner white male confidence because <laughs> God, guys seriously like the guys are really overselling themselves to the point where okay not, i don't want to generalize but like um i've heard from like big producers in bristol about how men are really overselling themselves to the point where sometimes it's actually like outright lying about their skills and then sometimes it actually <laughs> is to the detriment of the production and here we are like as women feeling like and I don't know if it's I don't know if it's because we've always been told like subconsciously that we don't deserve to be in the space but we really battle with this confidence thing right like we really battle to be like you know what actually like I do have, I, I can do this stuff. Like I'm skilled. I know my stuff. I've spent a lot of time educating myself around camera gear and animal behavior and whatever it is. So yeah, that's, that's one big barrier to entry. Um, I think another one is that ties into the previous question of like um, what, what this industry has historically been like. I think it's very, very much a boys club, right? Um, yeah. I think that this idea, idea of like having to fit in with the boys and the banter like that's you know that's that's kind of I feel I've personally felt like I need to 
fit in in order to be accepted in the industry and another thing is being able to carry heavy heavy equipment mm -hmm. right like i have always kind of felt this need to prove myself like i can carry heavy equipment i can do i can do what the boys can do like i'm just as employable as the boys and then i realized but you know what tessa like this is this is a backward way of thinking like you are who you are you've got your I'm physically a small human, <laughs> you know, but it doesn't, I mean, being able to carry a heavy camera or not doesn't make me any less of a cinematographer, you know, um, and that's really something that I had to, that's like a really deep conversation I had to have with myself, you know, and say like, you don't have to constantly be proving yourself in this way, like, yeah, like focus on your strengths, the things that you know that you can get good at, and and prove yourself in that way. I think also another major uh, barrier is the lack of role models. And I think that in part is actually what we're also speaking of is we cannot, we can't be what we can't see. Um, and that is a strong theme that came out of, of a film called Hidden Figures, for example, with women uh, at NASA, a historical drama uh, set in the US. But the whole understanding that you can't be what you can't see. Uh, and so for many of us, even as, uh, as scientists, as filmmakers, we don't see those role models. And so then we battle with, um, you know, even acknowledging our right to be in a place, uh, our right to tell stories. So this is why the work that we are all doing and that you, you all specifically as filmmakers in this field at whichever stage you're at. And I was just, you know, saying this to Tambisa, maybe we can bring Tambisa in. Uh, Tambisa is a marine scientist and is, works a lot in the coastal areas of KZN. Um, just tell us, Tambisa, um, your your journey into um, natural history filmmaking and wildlife. Um, thanks, thanks, um, Max. I wanted to actually chip in. Um, I know I'm not a very experienced filmmaker. I'm still in my infancies, but um, I think um, filmmaking and science have got a lot in common in terms of representation. Um, mm -hmm. There's not a lot of people of color. There's not a lot of um, women um, choosing. And even when they do choose to do it, there's not a lot of platforms that um, bridge the gap between the alpha male, white male um, head honchos and all the other women that are equally talented, even more talented, that have got stories embedded in them that they want to tell. So um, Yolanda did pick up on um, a little bit of, on my journey. And I think um, the experiences I've had um, in, in filmmaking, I mean, Tessa speaks about how she wanted to prove herself and, and, and pick up heavy cameras. But I really think from my view, looking into filmmaking, um, a platform needs to be created for women to thrive. Um, um, if, if you need to have someone carrying your camera for you, Tessa, you, then there needs to be room for that to be permissible and you not to be looked at as um, not competent just because you can't carry a heavy camera because it doesn't really define your art. It doesn't really say you're going to give me a good um, film. Um, so I think from, in my experiences, the Nature um, Environment and Wildlife Film Congress was such an instrumental platform for me to be able to exercise my my right to tell my stories and to know that my stories are valid. So we went through intense conversations and trainings and interacted with various people of different levels of experience who have an interest in providing platforms for people of color and women particularly to tell their stories. And what I see um, as a huge gap when industry doesn't do something about it is that if you look at the quality and the angle of all the films that are, that come out they've got very similar tones to them as pat says they really very predator prey um related like they're very masculine and they're very um aggressive sometimes and they, they don't really um hone or take out the real story that is embedded within. They all literally sound the same, look the same, but the story is still there to be told. So there's a huge gap 
uh, in the film industry when women are not given a platform to, to thrive. And I think industry needs to take some responsibility for that as well. Uh, while we're, we're all trying to get up there and put our work out there, they need to meet us um, halfway and create a platform where it's conducive for women to thrive. And I think that's critical. I mean, there's, there's, not, there's not any amount of kicking and screaming we can do down below in order for us to be elevated and looked and respected as filmmakers, unless industry does recognize the, the void you know, there's definitely a void that is there. I love that. Recognize the void. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm going to be using that one. Um, excellent. Um, yes. You I was just um, thinking about what you said about hidden figures. Can you Yes. Hear? Yes, well, go ahead. Well, I mean, partly what Hidden Figures re revealed was that women were doing these jobs and no one knew about it. Mm. And I think in natural history, you probably have very similar, you know, it's, it's similar because if you think of people like Fosse or you think of, of um, you know, people that were in illustration in very early um, science, a, a lot of them are women. We just yes. haven't. We, we don't know that it's not popularized. Um, you know, there's so it's women's there history is, in general is, is not exactly. uh, framed as so an I think, important conversation. Yeah, some of the first naturalists who were doing illustrations and doing detailed scientific drawings were women. I mean, I suppose it was a position that they were more given in a way to do the, the uh, illustration part, but a lot of science was learned from that, and that's very much like the figures. Mm. Um, we need to shine a light on some of those stories. I mean, the people like Fosse and Goodall are known, but there are such other uh, female heroes in the science and um, natural history field that we don't know about. I mean, do we know that one of the women directors on it, there's a female a woman director on um, the Planet series, that big BBC series? I mean, our assumption is that it's male. Mm. Um, the Planet series, Frozen, I think, oh. she's on. She's a producer, director on it. So they are role models, but I think they need to be more uh, in the light. So this, yes, I think there's two parts of that conversation. There's those who are doing the work and we don't get to hear about it. And then there's also the absence of voices. So, uh, you know, and we yeah. haven't also, I think another conversation is indigenous women's voices and the role that indigenous women have played historically with the land, with the environment. And I think the, the whole notion of humans being separate to nature has been such a widespread idea. Um, and I think as we're moving towards reframing the narrative, as we're moving towards thinking about indigenous knowledge, as we're thinking about solutions that have been there all along but we just haven't acknowledged them so i think we have such opportunities um, to go back and interrogate some of those things but we obviously need more people from those communities to speak from inside of it as well um, and have a different perspective on how to um, engage and, and, and just to share some of the, even the value systems and the ideas around community and um, the environment. What are your thoughts? Um, I actually wanted to uh, add something there. I, I lifted up my hand and I was like, I probably do like a raised <laughs> hand over there, but I was like, she can see me, so I'll just do this. <laughs> um, with what you just said, McGann, we, uh, you know, I think, I think, and also what you said, Pat, about the visibility, like, the, okay, the one problem is the, there's not enough. And then the second part is the visibility of those that are there. And then when it comes to uh, just uh, uh, any indigenous knowledge systems or any kind of indigenous communities, I think the problem there becomes a problem that I feel like South Africans or African filmmakers have in general, where it's like, then how do you tell these stories? How do you tell these stories? that it makes, it, 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 they are made mainstream, that they are accepted in mainstream kind of entertainment or you know distribution channels and whatever else. 
uh, so it, so that's always like a it's almost like a communication issue. How do you then okay cool these things do exist they are there. How do you take that without uh, you know muddying it in any way? Present it, tell the story, present it in a way that can be accepted by these audiences that are now very used to a very uh, Western way of storytelling and 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 uh, and it's still good enough and it's still well mm. received. You know? I feel like it's such an African problem. Never mind what industry or what you know segment you're focusing on. It's just it's a thing with our stories. Um, but at the same time, it's like then who dictates how stories should be told? You know, who mm. dictates mm, yeah. you know, this is the mm. way to create the story? Uh, it, could we not then just okay, we're creating these stories for South Africans, for other Africans? You know, we're creating these stories mm. for these people instead of always trying to also uh, embrace people who are probably not even interested yeah. or won't get the story. Yeah. You know, um, I think I that's a think huge uh, conversation on its own. Um, who wants to speak next? Is it Tessa or? Um, okay, I just want to say a quick thing. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Tim Jesus. Um, okay. Just because it's quite, it's, it's quite topical to add to what you were saying, Yolanda, is that um, this week, um, it's been the National Geographic Explorer Festival and they've been talk talking. We're losing her. Uh, How it really relates to parachute Sorry. filmmaking as well and that's basically where like have you heard about it basically where you've got like oh wait can, did i did i freeze yes you did yes. Can you, can you <laughs> um, sorry can you just repeat what you were saying because we didn't hear oh, it okay so um basically then we're talking about the idea of parachute science i was thinking about how you've got mm. um people from like colonial countries coming into like less privileged countries and doing the science and then taking it and like you know like like uh, one woman was, was saying that uh, she's from Sri Lanka and I don't know it was a research group from maybe the UK I'm not quite sure but they wanted her to apply for um, a full um, a research permit so that they could come and do the science in her country and she was like are you joking you know and I think about that in terms of filmmaking and indigenous knowledge systems and telling indigenous stories because like I'm now this is this is a question that I'm really dealing with a lot because I'm now making a film about the sand people in the Kalahari and I'm thinking how do I avoid this parachute storytelling like how do I make sure that I really avoid parachute filmmaking where I'm coming in I because the last thing I want is to impose the story in my head right like mm -hmm. I would like to create a platform uh, for them to be able to tell their own story but ideally what we need to move towards is is um, indigenous communities having the skills and the finances and yeah and just like the the opportunities to tell their own stories That's thank you um Tembisa? um I just wanted uh, Tessa's <laughs> comment actually brings mm -hmm. mine very much um um, it pairs very well with what Yolanda just said. Um, I think the the one thing that I I think also we need to be very mindful of is that um, the media space, like the audience, is changing. Um, people have been consuming the same material, the same um, narrative about Africa. I mean, Americans um, probably thinks we have, we have pet lions, but social media has revolutionized. Um, how people, what, what people choose to watch. And I think um, social media is an instrumental tool to use um, to put um, our stories out there because a lot of the people that are your, your audience want to know the real authentic story, Af African story for that matter, or the real science behind, um, a story behind the science. So I'm, I'm seeing there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a huge um, shift, maybe on social media mostly, in, in the viewers and what the viewers prefer to watch. I'm not really sure um, about the, the your couch potatoes, what they're expecting to see, but I know for a fact that social media is craving um, a different narrative around African stories, um, seeing more people of color behind the camera, um, seeing more authentic stories being told. But another thing that I, I really think that it needs to, I'm not sure if I'm applying, um, how, apply, how, how I'm applying myself um, into filmmaking is going to make me a broke filmmaker. But um, my my inspiration um, in be, in being a filmmaker is that as a scientist, 
we are compounded or almost forced to write um, journals and publish into journals that never get picked up by anyone, never get read by anyone, but that influence so much of how we live in the world at the moment. They influence policy and no one really knows about them. And I see filmmaking as, as a very robust and very um, versatile tool to use in order to redress some of the misconceptions that have been drawn, especially around women in science or conservation and people. I think it, it, it really can revolutionize how people see um, people in conservation. And that's purely what I want to, um, what the, the, how I want to use that tool. Um, I think um, people believe more what they see. And, and, and if you allow, um, if you give um, the right tools to local communities, you will see that the stories that are coming out of there are authentic. And I know a lot of people want to know um, about how ordinary people live um, in conservation spaces. So um, um, with my film, I really then decided that um, rather than being the scientists um, in the rocky shores, mm -hmm. I'm actually going to allow um, the, my characters to tell their own stories, um, to empower themselves and use the platform to tell their own stories. Um, as difficult as it might be and as challenging as it might be to direct and to produce, but I think the story that came out um, and in the end became such a wholesome story compared to what I even thought in my head. You know, so you realize that it's just a matter of you providing the platform and giving them the, the, the tools and having the right people in the room to, to support you with the skills so that the, they're able to use um, the tools in, in, in an appropriate way to tell their stories. So, for instance, in sciences, um, there are a lot of scientists on the ground, people of color, women who are doing impressive science on the ground that is no one knows anything about. They just don't have the, the right tools or mechanisms in order for, for people to know what they do on the ground. Even in conservation, there's a lot of black students that are studying conservation. A lot of them doing big mammals, they're studying lions, they're studying vultures, but no one knows about their work. So I'm seeing quite an interesting opportunity to use film to elevate those voices and shine a light on, on some of the sciences that are known to be purely white, male, or white. Mm. Wow. I mean, just to so take off. Uh, Go ahead, Pat. Hello. Um, I guess I wanted to just um, add to that. And, you know, and, and from a broadcast perspective as well, is what we're noticing, I mean, like every other genre, right there is um these are, you know these formats are not natural history programming is not an innocent uh, provider of of entertainment but it's complicit in the reproduction of ideology um you know ideology of the natural ideology of masculinity of aggression um it, of, of of spaces that are unpopulated by people of um of landless, I mean, of people of land that's open to be taken. There's a whole lot of, of, of sort of complicity that natural history has in the politics of yesterday and today. So when, when we look at natural history, I suppose we have to bring all of the things that place women in a position in society into the way we view and how we unpack natural history programming. So going, you know, to the SABC, I first had to think, well, why are there only, why are there, you know, over 80% actually of natural history programming skewing to 50 plus white male? And you have to look at the fact that it's both the, the way they, the images are constructed. Sorry, my phone has gone blank. Mm. Can't we can hear you though. Okay, I'll just carry on. Um, so, so then you have to think it's, it's the way the narrative is constructed, it's the way the images are done, it's the thematic material, it's blood brothers, it's, um, and then it's also um, the fact that you, that it's an unpeopled environment often. Um, and, and, and so if you shift basically seeing diverse people within that environment, and you start looking at programming that really people's environment, and you begin to change the politics of what is called natural history or what is called environmental programming. 
And what I'm seeing, you know, when I, I did a series a very long time ago called uh, Marion Island, and all that happened is that there were um, black birders, black scientists in the image, and that's the next year, and, and that programming on SABC skewed more to diverse audiences than any other programming, natural history programming. And it was just about who was in the camera and who was having a relationship to nature. Um, and then um, if we start looking at what's going on now, um, the more we are show, the more on S3 we are showing um, environmental programming that is related to people and a, a, a people's universe, the more we're getting diverse audiences. When it's not just completely rarefied natural history and the kind of rarefied narratives that are placed over them. Um, so, you know, Anyway, I thought that I'd, I'd say that. Yes, I mean, I think um, this is also, you know, ties in also to your earlier conversation, Yolanda, uh, with what makes a story universal? Who are we making a story for? And if you think of Africa and the diaspora, what are the numbers in truth globally? We always think of uh, the American conversation on minority. Hello. Audiences, when we think of McAnthony, we're just losing you a little bit. Yeah. Of black people, but the reality is, the the audience is actually, um, you know, probably one up thing the diaspora on this continent. Let's make it and the diaspora. Obviously, there's funding and. Uh, editorial issues and all of that, but but just thinking about the audience and who do we make it for? Even if you're making it for yourself, is you make like you have to believe as a filmmaker that maybe there's uh, a thousand other people who will be interested in your story, but maybe a million, maybe ten million. Um, even though as filmmakers we do need to be concerned about who the audience is, we also we represent that audience and we represent that void <laughs> that uh, Timbisa so beautifully uh, spoke of. Um, Can I just thank raise you so much. Issue? I mean, I think that this kind of thing, sorry, go ahead. McGantry, I just wanted to, you know, not only in terms of women's um, uh, role in natural history, but if you, if you think what, what precludes women from operating in natural history, it's often women's position in society. So if you're doing rarefied natural history, um, you're in the field for a year, six months, um, out in uh, you know a, a, an area where you can't quickly get to your children, to your house. So women, women's position in society often precludes them from that kind of natural history film. Mm -hmm. um, and then on top of that, it's the equipment, or all, all of that is changing. But it's, but I think there are other, just those kind of practical boundaries uh, that also have um, taken women out of that field. Definitely. And I think, I mean, one of the things, you know, we, we've talked about wildlife and natural history, but for me, it, it does include environmental engagement as well. So it's like we now have a, um, and it's not just a matter of uh, should women enter, but it's it's almost like the urgency for a woman's perspective in this crisis, so that we can share some of our, our yeah. own concerns and push those boundaries and create that kind of catalyst uh, conversation. So it's I don't think it's necessarily just about it would be nice. Uh, but it's it's more about the imperative for the woman's voice to change the narrative, to change how we see the world, um, and our separation from from the whole natural uh, world. You know, I think a lot. Yeah, we're, we're we, well. Hopefully, we're not as separate. Some of us are, are, are still on that journey of of not being so separate. But can I add something there, uh, Maggie? Yeah. Before you move on, sorry. Um, just also as you were speaking, Pat, and I'm also just thinking about the, the current situation I just find myself in now and just 
uh, at the various projects that I'm experimenting with, I think sometimes even as women enter the space and they and they experiment or they kind of infiltrate the space, it's it, it, sometimes it becomes a little bit hard to stay there because you don't have the support, like what Timisa was saying, you know, it's not permissible for you to need A, B, C, D, or to do this or do that. And so it becomes really hard to just stay in the space because it's just, it's emotionally taxing, I must be honest. Mm. And so mm. then you just, you just exit. And I have interviewed filmmakers who are now making documentary films and that's great, but they wanted to be in wildlife, they wanted to stay in wildlife, but it was just too, it was just too toxic. And there wasn't that space there wasn't that enough support with them being a, a female filmmaker, with them being a young black filmmaker to indeed kind of, you know, grow and develop in that space. So sometimes if that support isn't there and you can fight the battle, yeah, but yo, man, after a while, you have to ask yourself, is it worth the it? Work is you know? <laughs> if you don't have the yeah. support, really. And, and unless you are so focused on your goal and you know why you're there and you are ready to kind of be whatever comes, uh, yeah, you just, it becomes very difficult. Mm -hmm. No, um, I was looking Yolanda, at. Um... Yolanda, sorry, uh, Pat. Um, I, I just want to say, Yolanda, uh, after yeah, Pat speaks, yeah. just tell us about your first diving experience. Um, okay. Plunge us into a whole other immersive experience. Go ahead, I was going to. I was going to punt S three, but <laughs> there's this woman called Dr. Uh, Paula Kahumbu in Kenya. And I think you guys probably know about her, but I'd looked at her bio and she said, um, you know, speaking to the points that we're raising about the other roles that we have, she said she had to do field science for a year for her PhD, but she literally did it with her baby strapped to her back the entire time she was in the field. Um, and this wow. is a woman that wanted to be a ranger and was told that she can't be a ranger because she wasn't a man. And she was so persistent. And this is, and she's ended up literally being, you know, at the forefront of the field. But just, I was punting S3 because we just bought her program, which is called Wildlife Warriors. And she, um, she takes young people out into the field in Kenya, teaching, looking at endangered species, looking at fixing things that are wrong in the environment. And then we're going to do a South African series with her, with young um, teenagers here. Lovely. Um, I mean, definitely, uh, I mean, some nights you even have two wildlife programming. <laughs> in a single night uh, so it's 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 been it's so refreshing if that's if that's your interest but if you live in this world you want to know more about it so it's it's been great to to see so much programming um okay. you know but also like programming from india that's been really interesting um and just the the variety of uh, biodiversity and there's a woman who heads up that uh, who's the the host of that show so that really like makes you think about things in a different way. Yolanda, mm. tell us about your first diving experience and how you got in. Oh my gosh, I'd <laughs> love to. Um, uh, wow. Okay, so my first diving experience came as an invitation. Um, the Nature, Environment and Wildlife and Festival or Congress that uh, Timisa mentioned invited me over to learn how to dive with a few other uh, young filmmakers. Um, and the point I think was indeed to get the experience of diving and also to have the idea of being maybe possibly becoming an underwater uh, filmmaker just in your mind, in your head, because it still was very far for a lot of people. And um, I must be honest, I arrived at the scene uh, a little bit ill-prepared. Uh, ill-prepared in that I didn't do the homework. You're supposed to do this whole read-through of things, their tests, mental things, just like, you know, actually like little mini exams that you're supposed to do before you go into the water. Uh, but at the same time, I'm glad I didn't because had I known what would be expected of me, I was just gonna be like, well, no, no, thank you very much. When one of the very first things is like, you have to swim, I think it's like 200 meters, like 20 laps. I was like, what? And I'm so glad I didn't know that. I'm so glad I didn't know that because I just needed to jump when the time came and just swim and not think about it. But there's so many other things as well. But um, it was a very, uh, Sure, um, it, it was such a strange experience uh, for me because it became a very emotive one as well. I struggled in the beginning and I'm normally very much someone who is very eager, I can figure things out, I can try, I don't give up. But yo, the, the diving really just like, yo, it's one of those, it's, I can imagine it's almost like 
uh, indeed preparing to climb Kilimanjaro and such, where there's a lot of physical training, yes, but there's also a lot of it is very mental as well. And you have to kind of calm yourself and ground yourself in order for you to be still in the ocean, in order for you to be one with the ocean, if I could call it that. If, you know, in order for you to kind of master everything you need to master and be comfortable in life in this very alien world. And literally, for me, the ocean is literally, I, was, I felt like I was tantamount to going out of space. You're wearing breathing apparatus. You can't just breathe, you know? You are literally foreign. You are a foreigner in this place, in this thing. And it's just like the sounds, everything, and the looks, the colors. I mean, everything is just like you are, you are in a very, very different world. And it's just, you're in awe and you, and you get, you know, you have a very, I had a very clear feeling that, you know what, <laughs> I'm a visitor here. Like, you know, so just be kind, or just like, don't touch anything you're not supposed to. But I mean, I had, yeah, I had moments uh, where you're trying to just stay afloat and you, so you're hitting things. I was probably hitting fish and yeah. But um, it was such a beautiful experience. And um, I, I think without knowing it, one slowly falls in love with the ocean. And it changed my hair. I had a nice, huge, big, nice Afro. I now have a uh, lot hair and I suppose we rolling with that. So, um, but it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Did you make a film? Were um, you shooting? Yes, yeah, so that's uh, uh, that's a film I'm working on. That's my um, entry, I guess, into conservation or wildlife filmmaking. First, indeed, the experience of not even before even the diving, I, I watched a film, the first, uh, I think, uh, uh, inaugural in, uh, edition of Youth. Uh, one of their opening night films was a film called My Plastic Ocean. And you know, you always yeah. hear about these like plastic campaigns and stuff, and you're like, okay, cool, that's great. But I didn't understand, like, okay, so exactly, exactly, exactly. How does this, you know, affect things in a bigger, you know, like a bigger scope? Oh, and also how does it affect me personally? And then watching that film, I was like, oh, fish lover, mm. loving to eat, you have your salmon there and whatever else. Yeah, that's how it's affecting you. And I think then it made me realize how connected everything is. And then, so when I went uh, diving, it, it just further uh, expands indeed on just, um, yeah, just, uh, yes, the, the importance of the ocean, but also just just our humanity and how, you know, uh, just how ecosystems work and how we not, we're not separate from it. We're not, you know, we're not other, we're all in this together. Like it's, it's all in one, you know, and you know what affects what's going on here affects me and whatever I'm doing is gonna affect this. Uh, mm. And so, yeah, so that's, I think my whole film uh, literally is about that, but also the struggle of, being a, a black female also dealing with these questions and being a black female mm -hmm. dealing with these questions because then I have things like, uh, uh, my film is specifically about uh, braids because braids are plastic and I love braids. Uh, I love, you know, extra mm -hmm. hair. I love the, all the different things you can do with braids. I know, Demisa, I know people are on my case about this, but I'm like, I also love braids. I, I like doing braids, but Braids are also classified mm. as plastic and also braids are very much a kind of single use plastic if you think about it. Mm. Um, like it's just, yeah, you don't just, you don't reuse it. You, don't, you just don't. Um, and so also you just- the, oh, You're just, we're making a, a show on hair and I have to get you to do an interview for it. Oh, okay. no, oh. No, 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 this is her film. She's not going to do an interview. This is her film. Oh, this is a film. No, yes, it I is mean, like, it's like a film. cinematic. It's a proper film. Yeah, we're making a whole film. Yeah. No, no, we're just doing a reality show on her. On... It would just be so fantastic, your story. It's amazing. Buy the film. Yes, yes, actually, you're right. Please sell the okay. film. Please, please sell the film. Yes, so, let's so, do a yeah, please sell. Yeah, so there's lots of different questions, I think, uh, that have come up for me with me, my slow falling in love with the ocean. And, and, and it just kind of happens, you know, you just, uh, you know, I find myself going back to these dive sites. Tessa actually was down there with me. Tessa was making this film with me, the first little bit of it. And I'm like, wow, I'm back here again. I kind of like being here. I'm in the woods. I'm struggling still. But, you know, it's kind of, I, I want to get it right. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to learn what I need to learn being in this space, being in the ocean. And also then reconcile that and, and recon with who I am and who I want to be and what my cultural expression is, what my identity is. So yeah, those are the themes um, with the film. Lovely. I would love Thank to you come so with you one 
Yolanda, I need someone to teach me to go underwater. I'm so yes. claustrophobic. Every time I put that thing on, I just like, oh my God, I can't breathe. But meanwhile, the ocean is like a huge yeah. universe. It's a mind thing. You have to just get over certain things yeah. in your mind. I've just seen. And I over think certain I have fears. Has, uh, as soon as you hit the water, you forget. Mm. I'm also mildly claustrophobic, but as soon as you see the beauty of underwater, it's it, it escapes you that you you're claustrophobic. It, it it's so expensive. You, I don't know how to explain. It. It's like it's like. <laughs> no, I, don't know. I can it's go. I can just snorkel, but it's about the tanks and like the way you have to breathe and that you can't just yeah. put your head out into the oxygen. And I just panic. Yeah. So maybe I should take a whole lot of drugs and then go with you guys. <laughs> no. Yeah. no, don't do that. No. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> yeah, no drugs. But I definitely do think that diving is a constant, it really is a constant mental journey. Um, mm. you know, the, this idea of, and now um, doing my dive masters, like I'm having to put myself in very stressful situations but it's it's completely mental. It's like knowing, okay, it is it is hectic. Like diving is a difficult thing. It's not natural to breathe underwater. So when you first do it, it's yeah, and it's constantly like retraining your brain, your your brain, <laughs> your mind, <laughs> your brain, um, retraining your brain to be like, yeah, this this is stressful, but I'm okay. I can I need to stay calm and I, I know how to handle this. And then it's awesome. I think I must go with you guys because I went with a bunch of men and we went oh. out in some like scuba boats in the middle of the most in Mozambique and then we just got pushed in the water and I was like, oh my god, panic attack. Yeah. And now I've... no, I mean actually it's actually a good point. <laughs> Sorry. But it's a very good point, Pat, because I, I completely relate to that. My first time when I got my open water certification back in 2014, like it was, it's going back to the boys club, right? It was very much a boys thing. And I felt like I, I felt I wasn't able to express the fact that I was anxious and I was, I was panicking and I was suffering. And that's why like, I've actually kind of made it my mission now, like doing my dive masters for me is like my way of wanting to introduce people to the ocean in a way that makes them feel safe and Beautiful. calm and like I would I'm coming love with to, you you know I'd love that. <laughs> yeah please do I would love Maybe to um, help. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because I think like I really want to push this idea that it's okay to struggle like it's okay mm -hmm. it's okay if you're scared if it's okay if you're feeling anxious like it's completely normal and you are safe and like I'm with you you know and like we're and when you feel safe you want to do it again because the ocean is the best thing on the planet in my opinion yeah. you know and that's what we want we want people to fall in love with it and and filmmakers have to first fall in love with it so that they can communicate that beauty so this is why we need more women in the space making it uh because you have a unique perspective all of you have had a very unique experience that only you can share so that's that's the exciting um, um, reframing that we're doing. It's like, let's think about it in a totally different way. Yes, how it was was how it was, but where do we want it to go? I think um, maybe before we jump into that conversation, Tessa, just tell us a little bit about um, that film that you, you, you made with the dragonflies and the impact it had on you as a filmmaker and, and possibly your audiences. Yeah, sure. So, okay, so the water dancers, um, <laughs> where do I start? So basically um, a family friend of mine, Michael Samways, is a professor of biodiversity and ecology at Stellenbosch University. And I was, um, I had just finished my degree, my undergrad. Um, I was going to do my honors and he, we were having lunch one day and I just happened to mention that I wanted to be an environmental filmmaker and he was saying, well, he's got all this research. Um, basically, they're doing work up in KZN on how you can do conservation in areas of production. So, so their, their research currently is on the Mundi plantations. I guess that, that has its whole, uh, Mundi is a separate conversation, but um, basically what they do is they create ecological networks, which are these strips of land, um, like amongst the pine plantations that they leave open for conservation. Um, 
So yeah, so I basically kind of pitched the idea to a couple of my uh, my friends who are in my class and we decided we were going to do this. At first I was like, mm, do I really want to? The science seemed kind of boring. <laughs> and then actually it was my dad who convinced me. He read the article and he was like, think about the macro photography you can do. I was like, okay, I'm doing it, you know. I mean, <laughs> um, um, yeah, the, the experience was amazing. My team was so strong uh, just such amazing such an amazing group of people um I love them seriously and the film taught me a lot about how to really work with scientists um and how like it's actually it's actually so important for scientists and filmmakers to pair up because I think what I found is that like scientists are they're so passionate about what they do but like often ends up in a journal article in a library that you probably have to pay for that no one's ever gonna read or hear about unless you're like studying it right and I was like and it completely ties into what Tim Beast is saying is that there's so much amazing science being done but we need to get those stories out there we need to actually tell people what's going on um so I feel like I really it really helped me like solidify my position as an environmental filmmaker like okay so I don't have a science background I I actually I was almost going and I decided to go the film route and I'm actually so yet to delve this is breaking up into for the me science and also help like craft um wait sorry I feel like did I just cut out now Yes. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. So basically I was just saying that it solidified my position because I, I realized I could delve deeply into the science while also crafting a visual narrative and helping people fall in love with nature. And I think that really is, that's my purpose in life is to show people why it's important to care. And I think it also, what Yolanda was saying is about like, okay, you see the stuff, you see the plastic in the ocean, but you're like, okay, but how does it relate to me? Like, why should I care? And I think that's a question that I literally keep asking myself with every new idea that I have or every new maker. I ask myself that question. Why should people care about this? You know, why are people going to want to watch this? I think that you you've got your audience who's already into nature, who's already like into that kind of stuff. But the people who really need to see the stuff are, the, are the, the ones who need to be converted, right? The people who wouldn't ordinarily watch nature films, like wouldn't really care that much about nature. Like they're the ones that need to see it, you know? So this is why I'm really starting to um, focus on nature and humans together and that connection. And it's like, we've been talking about this a lot, like how we are part of nature. Like, <laughs> yeah, we are nature. We need to think about nature in terms of how it directly impacts our lives. Um, Tambisa, can you just share um, the film that you made. Uh, just give us a little summary of the story. Okay. Um, um, thank you so much for the opportunity. I, I I made a film. I won a competition through NUF um, to make a film, like a very um, short um, docky. It's called Uluanje Lushile, Meeting the Tides. And it was inspired by the work um, that I did as a marine biologist on the KZN coast in trying to encourage sustainable harvesting of mussels. So uh, essentially, um, the whole basis about my film is that when I worked with the women uh, those, all, all those years, trying to help them to harvest sustainably, I then started to realize that um, it was meant to be mutual learning because they had been harvesting sustainably for a number of years before we pulled up the fences and closed off um, the rocky shores. And what I was merely doing is reintroducing them to something that they've been doing since they like for mm -hmm. decades. Um, and I, I felt a deep sense of uh, responsibility to try and shine a light on, on that knowledge, um, but also to give um, some sort of um, platform for those women to be able to tell their stories. And essentially the story um, line um, focuses on how rural coastal communities depend on marine resources for sustenance. And it takes you through the motions of how early they wake up, how they gather. So you see that it's a festive um, 
time when it's time to harvest mussels and how they decide um, that it's a good time to harvest mussels. They've got environmental cues that they look out for um, that tell them that um, the tide will be low enough for them to reach the mussels um, and the mussels aren't spawning. You know, so they, they look at various components before they go out to, um, um, to sea. I mean, I mean, to, to the beach, but the, the most important thing that I wanted to reflect in my story, um, because these are quite poverty stricken communities, I wanted to focus more on their strengths and their weaknesses. So I tried very much to treat the story with much sensitivity. And you, you see in the visuals um, that it's, there's poverty everywhere, but it's not spoken of. And I just, and then they just vocalize what they've been through historically, how they were um, forbidden um, from harvesting mussels and what the, reper the repercussions were and, and how they got to be reintroduced to legal harvesting, you know, interventions from the local um, conservation body to get them to harvest legally and, and what they inspire or aspire to in future. Um, so it was basically a timeline to say, this is where we come from. We really used to harvest sustainably. And then this person told us we couldn't because of apartheid. And then, and then in the new dem democracy, we we're reintroduced, but then we want to um, improve our livelihoods by um, exploring small scale commercial opportunities um, in this space. So it basically is a, it's just a, a timeline on on their harvesting profile. Um, and then all the other components about their understanding of the ocean comes through um, in, in the film. Um, so it's, it is quite visual, but more than anything, it's more of a, a journey in the life of a traditional marine harvester. Wonderful. How long is Thank the film? Thank you film? so much. I think it's How long is just, over, just over nine minutes. I think it's eight. I don't know, it's just between, yeah, less than 10 minutes. It's very short, <laughs> but it, it, I think it, it, it drives the message quite strongly, well, for me anyway, and the feedback I've gotten from people who've watched it um, and the questions I'm getting from it tell me that it was as impactful as I intended it to be. Thank you, lovely. We've actually got quite a few questions uh, from our audience, which I'm going to throw uh, to the panel. Um, so some of the questions, one of it is, what advice would you give uh, female filmmakers interested in exploring natural history through film, uh, especially if it's something you haven't gotten uh, any experience in? Any advice? I can jump in there and start. Um, I think uh, just looking at myself, uh, where I started, uh, maybe start with what you know and start with where you are. I mean, we are surrounded by natural history. Uh, you know what I mean? We live on this earth uh, and um, we interact with it in various ways. And I mean, uh, one of the ways that uh, I interact with it is, um, yeah, through, I suppose, the diving and the water, but also I love hair. Like that's where I started. I literally, I'm a very big fan of hair. I make lots of films about hair. Uh, all of my projects in some way or form have some sort of hair theme in there, it's like in there. And that's where I started. Um, and I think if you start with what you know, um, uh, whether it's your first film or maybe it's your fourth film, you've done TV and all sorts, all sorts of other things, uh, there must be something that's kind of, you know, piques your, your interest. And uh, how you can approach it is the same as how you'd approach any other project um, if you are already in film. Uh, how would you approach making, a, I don't know, um, a, a, a documentary about maybe car spinning uh, or, uh, you know, whatever the, the themes are that you work with, I think you can uh, approach the storytelling of that. Uh, what I have found though, um, about uh, just kind of working in uh, or doing films around nature, conservation and such. And I think what attracts me to the field is the idea of um, uh, impact, like, like long lasting impact or, susta or sustainable impact uh, after the film. And by that, I mean, you can make the film and then you've just made the film, but you could also make the film and use it to educate. Like I'm sure Timbisa can go around lots of different communities, show the film and have discussions with, with, with uh, the community for many years to come. 
not just like, you know, the first two years, you know, festival circuit, no, for many years to come, the film can be used as a tool. And, um, and I think films in the sector, if, it depends on how you design everything, I guess, but I, I, I'm very much attracted to that, um, uh, the possibility of, of the film just not being a film for entertainment purposes, a film being a tool for something, a tool for maybe change of policies, you know, and governments, who knows, you know, uh, a film that will change people's minds and people's perspectives, you know, a film that will actually do something that will actually have an impact. Um, so yeah, but start with what you know, or where you are. Anyone else would like to um, speak to that? How do you start? Yes, Tessa. Um, yeah, so my advice would be, number one, just shoot as much as you can. That was the best advice that I got, is basically just, like Yolanda was saying, start with what you, what you know and what you have. Like, even if you just have a cell phone and you have a back garden, like go out and find a little subject, like a bird maybe, and just film it. Like basically just shoot as much as you can. Try to put content out um, on your Instagram page or maybe a YouTube channel if you have. And also build your network because, I mean, when I was first starting out, I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't know anyone. So actually NUF was really, really amazing for me because, um, that's the Nature Environment and Wildlife Filmmakers Congress in Durban. My, that's where I really got to just meet other people in the industry. Like the first thing is you really need to know who the industry is um, and you start to become part of a family. Like everyone is just so welcoming and so generous with their knowledge and time. Um, I think because I think what's really special about this industry is that everyone just really genuinely cares about saving the planet and that's amazing you know and then mm. I always say tell tell people what you want to do like just tell everyone what your end goal is you know like even if you think it's wild and crazy and unachievable right now you never know who's got an opportunity up their sleeve up their sleeves so just say what you want to do mm. you know that's my advice thank you here's something here's another question which could be uh, a bit controversial uh, I know that the film Octopus Teacher has had a big impact on bringing focus to South African national documentaries. How do you think this is going to impact women in the industry? Will they also benefit from this? Or might the added attention and excitement distract from the gender imbalances in that niche of the industry? Uh, can I also just say that the there is a woman producer on that film, by the way. Uh, so it, it is actually, well, Craig Foster is the um, director, the producer is a woman as well. Any thoughts on the octopus teacher and its impact um, in terms of women in, in, in this field? Well, there are a lot of interesting thoughts about you're frozen. Does anyone else want to speak to that question? And while we wait for Pat to come back to us. Um, okay, I'll just chime in quickly. Oh, Yolanda, you want to go? Sorry. Oh, no, no, go, go for it, Tessa, go for it, Tessa. Okay, it's just a quick one. I mean, I think the fact that, like, I guess my, my opinion is that the fact that, like, um, it's, it's produced and directed by women, um, kind of, I think that's a good thing, actually, because then it shows that, like, there are opportunities for women. Like if, if women can produce and direct an Oscar winning documentary, then there are, yeah, then, then we can do it too. That's my opinion anyway. Sorry, it was produced by a woman, but the director is Craig, who's male. Um, oh, no, but um, Pippa uh, Pippa's Erlen. also in there, yeah. And at oh, some Pippa point I think she was, yeah. And I think she shot some of it as well. And she was also oh, nice. editing, she edited the first, a few renditions of it, I think, before so Netflix then, came on. So what are we saying? So actually, there were women involved in that project, which is uh, actually pretty good because it can, you know, it obviously, even though the question uh, asks, oh, does it dis dis detract from gender, the fact that women are on the team making it, that, that actually um, is interesting. Great. Um, Yolanda? I, I think... Um... I'm not too sure if I fully understand uh, the question, but the little bits of it that I, I do get, um, whether like, you know, 
now that this big win has happened for South Africa, what happens now, you know? And um, I think, or at least I'm finding as an independent filmmaker that the gatekeepers are still the gatekeepers. And until the gatekeepers change, you know, the rules of the game will change indeed who the criteria for who they lay through the gates, um, things not very much changes. So I the gatekeepers are like, oh, wait, there's some interesting stories coming out of South Africa uh, with, uh, you know, mixed teams, mixed diverse teams. Uh, let's see, you know, let's do something specific for that, or let's have a call out for that. Let's look for that kind of content. Then it's like, oh, okay. Um, otherwise, um, as independent filmmakers, and we continue just struggling on the path that we're on. Okay, the struggle is a, is a strong word, but we continue just um, navigating. <laughs> no, because it's, it's like at some point, it's like, if this is a life, I must accept this is a life, but I can't call it struggle. I don't want to be. You right. know what I mean? I in my 50s, and I'm still a struggling filmmaker. No, you know, it's like, no, if this is how it is to make films independently, and this is what it is. It's just, it, it's, you know, you're creating something. It's okay. It is what it is. But so, and, and but I think also as a, um, a filmmaker, I've also learned to, to stop waiting, um, to stop waiting for people to invite you to their table. Um, and I say this after like years of applying for different labs and you're also putting in your submissions and applying for this and applying for that and you think that you've got all your you know uh what's it what's that phrase your cards and your ducks in a row you've got all your, your ducks in a row <laughs> um you know you know what i mean you've upskilled yourself in all the various ways you need to but still you can get a no still you can get excluded still you're not ready you know what i mean there's so many factors sometimes that comes into uh, uh adjudicating things um, but mm -hmm. so with that said, I, I, I have learned to, uh, going back to a bit of what Tessa said, just get started, get going, just do something, shoot something, even as you're waiting for the funds to come through, even as you're waiting for the big break, even as you're waiting for, you know, indeed, uh, a Netflix or SABC3 to commission your stuff, even as you're waiting for all of those fantastic big oh, gold moments, just get going with what you have on your plate right now and make it work yeah so those are my Thank thoughts you. um we do have a question about um female filmmakers with disability and their engagement with filmmaking in general um yeah are there opportunities for for women with disabilities in this sector I think um, the answer to that question is uh, is slightly similar to my previous answer, but also going back to what Timisa said um, uh, about being female, it's like, you know, things have to be permissible. Like, give me, allow me to get a second assistant just to carry my stuff. Allow me to do this if I need to, if I need to. So I'm not, you know, not every cinematographer, every female cinematographer I, I, I needs that. But, um, so I think with someone who also has, um, who's like just differently able, then the, 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 the space, the set, the team has to allow for that. Um, I remember having a, a, a table read with a friend who uh, was heavily sick and you could say she just, uh, yeah, she, she, she had limits to what she could do at the time. But once I prepared the team and I said, okay guys, this is what's happening. I bring this person aboard because it's what they want to do. They want to be involved and, and you're in the creative space and all of that. It's just uplifting and whatnot. But once everyone is on the same page, okay. So when it's time to little things like, okay, cool. Uh, if she needs help to go to the loo, this is what, let's take a moment. It might be a little bit extra, but this is what we're going to do. Okay. Can someone help me do this? Okay. Can we do that? How can we work around it? So you've got to create the space. You've got to create the space to facilitate mm -hmm. and, and to aid that. Uh, but then again, it goes back to producers, you know, are producers willing to create those kind of spaces or is it just going to be about a rush and time and such? But if you mm -hmm. are, if you yourself are a producer who's got, uh, you know, who's differently able or limited abilities or anything like that, then what kind of space do you want to create? You know, what kind of teams do you want to put together? Mm -hmm. And I think you just need to find those people in the industry who um, they have a similar vision, I think, and who have a, a similar Kind of maybe worth it take and like maybe an ethos you guys share like a similar you know way of just looking at things yeah values yeah so um and then if you if you if you uh collaborate with those people 
and uh, you know, and you guys kind of balance each other out. Uh, then there's no absolute. I, I don't see any restrictions or limitations. But you've got to do the initial work. Uh, mm. No one's no one's waiting. No, I, I've seen that. No one's waiting. Do you need help? Do you? What would you like? No, like you've got to you've got to like just get it started yourself. You just have to. It's just one of those things in this industry, and especially if you're female. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so even though we've spoken about some of the challenges we've heard from exciting new entrants into this field, what is the vision going forward? Um, there is a, a question from the floor, and I want to wrap this up with the vision for the future. So we've looked at things historically, we've looked at things currently in terms of people's personal experiences, but what is um, what is, what's the vision? What can we imagine? What would we like to see? Uh, the question from the floor is, uh, what is the possibility of SABC commissioning short nas natural history films made by women? Obviously, that's a question for you, Pat, if you have joined us. Maybe you can kick us off with that. And then other people can speak yeah. into what does it look like? What's your vision for how you'd like to participate in this space? And what would you like to see? Um, certainly on, on S3, um, we're trying to incorporate a lot of environmental programming into the um, bouquet offering. Um, you'll see that we've, um, there are two slots on a Sunday. There used to be only one, and we now have one at 1700 um, to 1800 on a Sunday. And then we brought some of those through onto a Wednesday. They repeated there. And then during the week at a 5.30 slot, we also have um, sort of environmental investigative programming. I think earlier you spoke about a program we have called On the Brink, Magantri, yes. um, uh, which is set in India. Then we've just um, purchased, we're in the throes of purchasing um, the Kenyan series called Wildlife Warriors, which is headed up by a female scientist. Um, and we're going to localize that and do it in South Africa. So to use her format with her as the host um, with South African uh, young people going into the environment and looking at um, uh, serious issues in our context. Um, and then I'm gonna put out a brief um, fairly soon uh, to the industry to make a series of, of uh, natural history programs, which I'm sure that we will look at uh, women directors. Um, we haven't thought exclusively about that yet, um, but it's, it's certainly a thought as to um, making that part of the RFP. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, what's the dream, guys? Kessa? What would you okay, like to yeah. see going forward? <laughs> you know what, like... I don't know, it's going to be a simple question, but uh, answer, but I think honestly, I just, my dream is that we just, there's, we abolish this idea of like competition, like people, like I want, I want us all to just like forget about that and help each other, you know, and just be like, there is no competition. We all just want to save the planet. Let's all just help each other and create opportunities for each other and not feel threatened. Like there shouldn't be any threats, you know. Um, obviously you want to you want to improve on yourself constantly and like compete against yourself. But like I don't like this idea of like people trying to hold on to jobs for dear life and hold on to opportunities. Like I would my dream is that we just all share openly and help each other. Thank you. Tim Pisa? Um, um, okay, thanks so much. I've had quite a good time listening to some experience on filmmaking. I mean, I've been making notes. <laughs> if you've seen, I put my head down. But um, on a personal level for the future um, with filmmaking, I, I'm planning to do a series. Um, I don't want to give away a lot, but uh, um, I'm planning to do a series along the coast, um, just um, unpacking um, important information. Um, to be shared in, in, in South Africa and hopefully um, globally. But um, um, Mags, we had very interesting conversations yesterday about the future. 
And I'm not going to lie, that kind of inspired a direction because um, I think I was a little bit short-sighted um, um, in terms of filmmaking, putting it in film festivals, getting it awards, you know, but then then the bigger picture needs to needs to develop. And I really think I can't wait until um, there's a formidable platform um, for young or black film, filmmakers to put their work out there in a very constructed fashion that is easily accessible, um, not only to local South Africans, but internationally, maybe an online platform where um, filmmakers can share good quality content, um, just um, putting out good knowledge out there, you know, sharing about African conservation, social issues, um, sharing about um, ordinary lives, but like really wholesome stories that we can really bank on um, in our history. You know, so I really would like like an ar archivable platform, you know, a place to keep all of that treasure, you know, and, and provide access to it uh, as far and wide as possible. Wonderful, lovely dream. Uh, I'll definitely be talking to you more about building that one. <laughs> uh, Yolanda? Um, I think what I could add to both what um, Tessa and um, uh, what Yumi have said is I think it would be great if uh, the females or the women that are the gatekeepers or are in face of influence mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, in those positions where um, they can make things happen, um, if those women would be quite supportive of other women and not supportive in that now you are you know, it, it's, quote, it's a quota system or, you know what I mean? And you're mm. not uh, fully looking at um, all of the criteria you need to look at. I think, no, uh, do what you need to, uh, you know, align everything the way that you need to and tick all of the boxes that you need to tick and make sure that it's at the level and standard that you need it to be at. Um, but indeed, putting away uh, any of this, there can only be uh, one female in the space or one star in the space or so many people doing this and, I'm the one who's in this position and I must just hold the sport. Um, but literally indeed allowing a, a, a way it makes sense and where it's, it, it is possible. Uh, just, yeah, allowing other women to, um, to, to thrive and to be in that space and to be supported uh, and to have everything that they need indeed to develop and uh, to succeed. I think for me, that would be great. I think particularly in the space, but also uh, in general, just uh, in, in, in film and uh, it just, uh, yeah, in film and for us just as local filmmakers. Thank you. Uh, Pat, your vision for the future. So the first dream I have is to be continually inspired by these women on the panel and then to um, ask them that I need to dive. I need to go and dive. <laughs> I literally... I mean, you guys think it's funny, but a couple of years ago, I went diving with this male crew. It was a total boys club and I had a complete panic. And then I went to therapy and the therapist said to me, why are you here? I said, because I can't die. <laughs> it's like, I can do anything else, but I can't die. But the set, I mean, the, obviously the more citizen oriented part of me wants S3 to succeed, not because I just wanted to succeed as a channel, you know, out there. It's a public broadcasting channel. Um, with a commercial imperative, but we literally can do so much around um, consciousness in terms of the environment, in terms of climate change on that channel, but it absolutely needs the support of viewers, it needs the support of the citizens in order to succeed, because if I don't get numbers and audiences, we can't continue to do the kind of programming that's been put out. So it's, it's a platform that we have to grab and we have to say we're going to use it and it's going to become successful. And, and my number one issue on it is in the environment. I think if for, for us all, the planet is the most important thing right now um, in terms of economics, sociology, everything. Um, and then the other you know, hope that I have is that we continue to see the kind of diversity that's coming into environmental programming and also the amount of I think COVID has, has allowed us all to really get out into the universe, to appreciate the environment more. Because when I go into natural spaces, I'm seeing so much more diversity of people in those spaces. And that's just a fantastic dream and one that should be built upon. 
let people experience the environment and and get the pleasure of being there and then want to look after it and conserve it mm -hmm. and we clean up the plastic <laughs> in our oceans and our water did you guys see sea spiracy mm. um i don't know other people want to respond anyone see sea spiracy i have no not seen it yeah but i've heard it? um mixed reviews about it yeah the uh, yeah. yeah i need to see it for myself <laughs> yeah and then you can tell me what you think of the signs but i really didn't want to eat fish ever again it was terrible <laughs> anyway but thank you guys for being such an inspiration today it's fantastic yes i mean and and this is what i was saying to everybody is Yes, you may be at the start of your journey. That's okay. You've begun. And that in and of itself is the inspiration. Uh, we can't be what we're not and we can't do what we haven't done. So where we are is okay. It's just about having a plan for where we want to get to. Uh, and I think uh, this conversation, I have to just say, was actually inspired by Zanele and Tembu who is the chair of SWIFT. So I'd like to thank her for the inspiration and for, and she, cause she was a commissioner in the space for many years and was very concerned about the lack of diversity, not only in South Africa, but globally. So it, it was really her insight and experience that have brought us all together. So thank you so much, Zanele. And uh, I'd like to thank Pragna Prasotam Kok from NUF as well, who helped us find some of these incredible women and connect with them. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't get to speak to uh, Tando Shozi, who I'm hoping we'll have another conversation with, uh, who also would have brought a lot of insight into the space from a historical perspective and her insights uh, in factual programming. Um, Sharon Jackson, Mandisa Zita, the festival director. Thank you, everybody, Taryn, for, for all your background uh, work as well. Um, this is such an exciting conversation. And people always are, are concerned when, when it's like, oh, but I don't have enough experience. I just made one film. And it's like, it's, it's guys, it's OK. Uh, let's start where you are. And I think that was the biggest inspiration, hearing your experiences and your excitement about um, nature itself uh, is hopefully going to inspire many people. I know many women who have been, uh, who've been making films who may not have considered it or want to, hopefully this has allowed people to, to think about expanding their, their horizons as well. So we're really looking forward to seeing how this conversation develops and let's continue the conversation. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you again you for you. having this panel. It's been amazing. Lovely. Thanks, yeah, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.